in New York. The trial of four men accused of bombing in the World Trade Center bombing gets underway today. The February explosion caused by a car bomb killed six people and injured more than a thousand. The defendants could face life in prison if convicted. It turns out that his name is Mohammed Salami. But at the time, I'm talking to him and uh, I introduce myself. I'm Ken Strange, I give him my business card. And then subsequently, after the World Trade uh, Center is bombed, there's a newspaper that came out and his face is on the front cover. And it says, the face of terror. Right, so um, what this uh, character was doing is he was actually uh, working on behalf of Saddam Hussein. Uh, and specifically the Iraqi military um, uh, group. And they were sourcing out uh, equipment uh, that could be used in Iraq, uh, anything from computers to even, uh, you know, there were materials that could be used to uh, not renovate or, or actually to um, uh, patch up uh, runways that have been bombed. So he was sourcing, you know, uh, anticipating the Gulf War, so he was, uh, and then these uh, centrifuges uh, for isotopes and nuclear things. So he was sourcing out everything for basically the Iraqi military. Mm -hmm. That's what was going on. So can you <clears throat> highlight then, because this is a number of the stories that we're kind of talking about, you know, during your time with the mm -hmm. um, Joint Task Force, is focus on a lot of these different um, Arab groups, Arab extremist groups that are kind of within the U.S., but this was all the time building towards what you just highlighted, the first the Gulf first War. Gulf War. So <clears throat> can you maybe explain what the <clears throat> situation was happening at the time and while why there was starting to be that buildup and like there was that feeling in the air that we were going to war? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, um, as you know, Saddam and Iraq had taken uh, Kuwait by force. Uh, and, you know, the United States uh, policy was, uh, you know, you shouldn't have done that. And that's not what countries do. And. Uh, you, you know, uh, Saddam had gripes with the Kuwaitis. He considered them to be spoiled, arrogant, uh, selfish people, and uh, the sitting on the oil fields that should be his. Right. So uh, that was all happening in the background. And meanwhile, you know, we're we're in a area where it's uh, you know one of the uh, uh, heaviest populations of uh, Arabic uh, people in the country. Uh, that and Detroit. So you know, we're keeping an eye on you know Saddam is our adversary. So we're looking at anyone that has contacts with Saddam. And again, people that were Ba'ath Party members were Saddamites. And so you had to, uh, you want to definitely be vig vigilant and, and see who they were and find out what are they up to, especially when people are traveling just prior to the war, going back and forth like a lot. So mm -hmm. you get, you, something is up. So Yeah, it's, it's interesting too because a lot of people – that that time gets glossed over because of what eventually happened on 9-11, that it was like mm. it was such an extreme. Yeah. That people kind of forget yeah. that yeah. Like 9-11 wasn't the starting point. No. It was kind of the Oh, it was building. It, it was building. And you know, and I, I say and, and you know this in my book, uh, we were watching uh, the uh, early stages, uh, the the beginning, the infancy of uh, bin Laden in our own country. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, uh, for example, uh, Said Nozer, which was one of the people I mentioned in my book. This is this is the guy that killed uh, Rabbi Kahani in Manhattan. So he's part of all these fundamentalists, uh, Egyptian and and uh, uh, other folks, Palestinians. And so uh, you know he is he's part of that 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 group that then um, they have spiritual guidance from Abdul Rahman, uh, Omar Abdul Rahman, the Sheikh, the blind Sheikh. And meanwhile, all of these people are. Um, basically in the shadow of, of, of bin Laden, because bin Laden is over in Sudan, he was in Saudi Arabia, then Sudan, then Afghanistan, and he's kind of, uh, you know, calling the shots here. So this was all really the beginning of Al-Qaeda, the, the, the absolute beginning, and I was there on the ground for that. Can you highlight this quick too? Because you were in Saudi Arabia at the time. A lot of people don't know this about Bin Laden, but I heard you say this on another podcast, and just it's been referenced before. You were seeing a ton of construction signs when you were around Saudi Arabia. So can you maybe highlight that quick, and it yeah. just helps people put in perspective. Yeah, I, I sure was. Uh, you know, it was astounding because um, 
you know, every day I would go to the school, you know, I'd have to pass at least uh, four or five bin Laden uh, signs on the roads, uh, the, the bin Laden construction company. And so I, I would ask, who's this guy bin Laden? And, you know, I was told, oh, he's, uh, he's actually a Yemeni uh, that had uh, come up to Saudi Arabia uh, and had started working for the royal family and had done such a great job, uh, you know, with the um, construction of this uh, grand mosque in Mecca that, that the uh, royal family decided to keep him. He, he was the go-to guy for construction projects, and uh, which were pro prolific, as were the number of wives that he had, too. That was prolific as well. And bin Laden was, you know, the progeny of, of, of one, from one of those uh, wives that he had. Yeah, most people don't realize that, because like, there was such a, I don't even know if it's pop culture, but just an idea that they were living in caves, and, they, you know, they thought... Bin Laden was from a poor country in the Middle East. And it's mm -mm. like, no, his family was no. nigh billionaires. No, no. I mean, he was, uh, you know, uh, my understanding, he was a spoiled kid. And he did spend uh, time uh, partying in Lebanon and Beirut, uh, which was, you know, kind of a party place for, for Saudis. Uh, if they weren't going to uh, Thailand or richer ones would go to London and Paris. But the Others would go to different places. But, yeah, no, it was amazing that, uh, you know, and we're, we're about the same age, Bin Laden and myself. And sometimes I think, my God, you know, he was he was in Jeddah, just, you know. Not, yeah, right not, down not, the street. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not too far from me. And maybe I even uh, ran into the guy. Could you imagine? Oh, my God. That was... that's, that's in the next book. Okay. Uh, oh, 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 I spoiler see. Alert. <laughs> I spoiler see, alert. I see, I see. I, I, I can't get over my skis on that. No, well. We'll have you on when that next book comes out, okay. and then we'll get into that. So fair enough. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good teaser, um, man. All right. So you mentioned the name um, El Sayed Nazar. Nazar. No, no, Can you dive into that that story as well? Because, like you said, th these are foundational. A lot of people don't like we were saying understand mm -hmm. what was happening mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. but these are foundational yeah. pain points yes. that led to the eventual boil over that was 9-11. So. Right, right, right. Yeah, so, I mean, he's one of these um, Middle Easterners that decides, uh, you know, he's going to come to America and, um, you know, find a future of some sort. But when he gets here, he finds out life's tough and, um, you know, uh, it's not easy being uh, from the Middle East and, you know, living in America, it's, you know, there's going to be some, some pain to that. And, uh, you know, he gets together and he falls in with a group of kind of um, uh, like-minded uh, young men who are um, frustrated with, with their lives and what's happening with, and, and, and so they, they get very affected by these preachers, these imams in, in these uh, mosques. So they, they kind of, uh, joined together as kind of a group of, of these fundamentalists. And Nozer is kind of the, uh, the beginning of all the problems that, uh, you know, go right through to the first World Trade bombing and then 9-11. It really starts with, with him. Uh, so, again, like I said, he's the person, he's the gunman. And he murders uh, Kahani, who was a, you know, rabble-rousing uh, Jewish um, uh, rabbi, uh, you know, who is maybe part of the Jewish Defense League as well. Uh, but he, he, you know, Said Nozer kills him, uh, tries to flee. Uh, he shoots a, an off-duty, I think it was a, a marshal's uh, guy. And uh, then he's uh, arrested. He's finally arrested. And, uh, you know, then we're called in. C-10 is called in to kind of go out there to his house and uh, collect, um, you know, the evidence. And we, I remember I was part of that team carting out boxes and, 20, 30 boxes from his apartment uh, in uh, New Jersey. He was married to an American girl who had converted to Islam. I, I remember that. And, um, um, you know, then the rest of it, he's, you know, he's in, he, he gets off, but then he's back in prison. And then from prison, he's working with his other Confederates. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like a gang of, of these, of these um, uh, jihadists in, in, in the New York, uh, New Jersey area. So what was C-10's feeling at this time? I mean, this is like where you're saying, they've been watching a lot of these groups for a number of years, but now we're, we're again, starting to go towards that boiling point. Yeah. Like, was there a level of anxiety or like, I guess, what was the feeling in the task force at that time? Well, look, um, the feeling was, I mean, there was so much going on at the time. I mean, when I, when I stepped on board, uh, they, they were still investigating Japanese Red Army, uh, a guy that, you know, Yu Kikimura, who had 
you know, come over here to bomb uh, the uh, Navy station in Manhattan, right? But so there were so many things going on. So this was just one other thing uh, at the time. So again, I, I'm not here to bash my colleagues, but and understandably, they hadn't done anything in the Middle East, so they really didn't know um, the the ins and outs of of, of Middle Eastern people and what they um, what their aspirations and their frustrations were. So uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, the uh, one, the New York Police Department handled this as a homicide, and uh, there was a point where they could have handled it as a you know joint terrorism thing, which they did not because the NYPD had decided, no, it's just a, it's just a homicide. It's a crazy guy. And, yeah, now there were uh, other people, um, uh, and there were some in NYPD, and I know them, as a matter of fact, who've come out and said, I, I remember going before, uh, you know, at the task force and, 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 you know, trying to tell them this, this is bigger than that. This is not a homicide. This is something else. This is coordinated. This is, there's a plan here with these guys. Something is going on, but they were kind of poo-pooed. No, no, we don't. So, uh, you know, I think that was the attitude from the beginning. And I'm not saying that I saw right through it and, you know, oh, this is, but uh, it soon became apparent to, to me and then to the other people on the squad that there was more uh, happening here. There's more at work. Uh, there, were, there were other characters that uh, were fomenting and there were other signs that uh, people, well, look, uh, and here's, here's part of the problem. We have a New York task force and a Newark task force. But we're operating, and we knew that we knew their their FBI agents and their task force great people, and I actually tried to get us together more often, and that's in the book. But we were operating in our own silos. Like uh, New York was their own animal; they had their own informants, their own issues, their own uh, jihadists, and we had ours. But but what was happening is that you know these jihadists would live in New Jersey and work in New York, right? So we're just going back and forth. So. Uh, and I mentioned this in the book. I just wish we were kind of uh, more um, t together, united, these two JTTFs, because we had a lot in common. And, and that became very apparent. We had a lunch in New Jersey, and we're all talking, oh, you know that guy? Oh, we're, we're on this guy, too. You're kidding. Oh, and what? You're no kidding. Oh, well, look, I have a guy who can help you. And, you know, and it, over lunch? You, you know, so they, yeah. they, 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 we could have done so much more, I think. Uh, so... Unfortunately, it, 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 it didn't work out too well. Yeah, no, that I know you touched on that in the epilogue, and that's definitely something that we'll dive into a little bit more because I think it's, it's a pretty important message. And it's also in regards to American people, they should have an understanding of that and also look towards how you know, policy is dictated. Right. But continuing with, you know, like you said, it, the couple of years that you're working on this, it's it, one of the most high stakes times stuff's rampant everywhere. Mm -hmm. One of the other crazy stories that popped up was an apparent assassination plot on president Bush at the time. Correct. Right, right. Can you dive into that case? And I guess, yeah. you know, what the ramifications were with that. Yeah, that was the case of Jamal, uh, Jamal Wariat. And, uh, this was a, um, he was a naturalized U uh, S citizen from uh, the middle East. I think he was Palestinian roots and, but had been raised in Kuwait, I think. Uh, so, and, and, and he was in the U.S. Army at, at one point. So uh, apparently he he calls over to uh, the Iraqi embassy or the consulate or, or someone Iraqi affiliated and and um, says, you know, starts threatening uh, Bush, uh, George Bush, the father and and other people, other politicians. And so this was a serious threat. We we find out we have a Secret Service guy on the task force. So we get, we go right into you know where is this guy? He's right in our neighborhood. He's in he has a store in Newark, and I think he lived in Rutherford. So uh, I, I just remember we we convene and our, our, we have an acting supervisor, and I uh, and so we know we know where the guy is. He's in this uh, grocery store, which he seems to run or own, and so I offer. I said, look. Uh, we can find out some stuff right now. I volunteer to go over there. Um, you know, my uh, backstop will be as some kind of a graduate student and who speaks Arabic lived in the Middle East. So I could pull that off, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they, they say, okay, go for it for now. Be careful. Um, and so I go out to this place. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable because I know that people are watching me. There are surveillance units. So I go into the grocery store and I, you know, I engage the guy. 
And, uh, oh, he's like, oh, you speak Arabic? Oh, quiz, alhamdulillah, inshallah. And, and we're really kind of hitting it off. But as we're hitting it off, I'm kind of trying to find out about him. Where are you from? And, oh, you know, and so, uh, so I, I gathered intelligence is what I was doing. And um, at the end, and this is where I kind of screwed up, uh, which is in the book. And, uh, you know, I said, uh, you, know, who, you know, I'm Mr. Re please, he said, please, uh, this guy, please give me your name. So I, I'm here, I'll put it on a piece of paper. I'm Mr. Richard or Mr. Richards or whatever mm -hmm. I was. Um, and then I put my real phone number yeah. down there. I just didn't, I didn't, yeah, I didn't think it through. I just automatically put the phone number. Uh, wish I hadn't done that. So you know, I go back uh, to the squad. Hey, what, what's going on? What happened? So this is what happened. Okay, that's great. Good. Okay, good. Now we'll, you know, now we know more about the guy. Uh, you know, he doesn't seem like he's going to be killing anyone next few days. Well, we can sit and watch him, the whole thing. And I said, uh, boss, I got to be uh, come clean with you. I, I, I screwed up. And he, what do you mean? And I said, um, you know, I gave him uh, my bogus name as we agreed to, but for some reason I gave him my, my, my real phone number. Oh my God, this guy, he just, my boss reamed me out. I never felt so ashamed and I felt so bad, uh, you know, right in front of all the, the squad and I, you know, I screwed up. I fucked up. And, uh, but he, but he, you know, in the end he said, Hey, uh, we'll let it go. Let me help you get a new phone number. You know, we don't want anything happening to your family. We just didn't know who this guy was or, or what he could do. So we're better to err on the side of caution. But, uh, so what happened after that is they decided to, again, you know, they took this threat very seriously. And the Bureau did what it does best. It threw all these resources into this. And so we were watching this guy uh, at his home and at his, um, uh, at his store 24-7 for several months. And uh, then they got an undercover guy who was a you know professional undercover, had worked on so many great cases. And when I heard that he was being pulled into the case to make contact with our guy, Jamal, I knew it was over because this guy's a... He's a thespian. He's a... He's the guy. Oh, he's the man. I mean, you know, he's a legend. You know, he's in the Smithsonian Magazine about some great cases. So I knew that Jamal was no match for this guy who spoke Arabic fluently, uh, lived in the Middle East, and it, it was over. And that's what happened. So Jamal ended up coming would, forward and like... Yeah, he was arrested in, in the end. You know, he, he, he gave up uh, what he was... Yeah, he started make, giving plans to our undercover. Yeah, I want to do this and we could take out these military bases. And um, But in a certain way, Jamal was all talk because he didn't really have those people to assist him. But still, you never know. So they had to shut it down and say, mm -hmm. just, just just take this guy down. Yeah. You know, you never know. He may take a rifle and, and, and kill somebody. So, uh, yeah, so uh, it, was a, it was a great case and uh, they arrested uh, Jamal. By that time, I was uh, no longer with the FBI. I was with another federal uh, agency, but uh, it worked out well for the squad, and I'm, I'm happy for them. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. And plus, I feel like more of those cases happen than people realize as well, which is scary. But it's like situations like that are developing. Like you said, it's not as simple as, oh, he made a threat. We can just go arrest the guy. I mean, right. you got to. Right. You, you have to scope it out. How big is the threat? Who's yeah. involved? Yeah, exactly. And is there a countdown clock there as well? You guys are like 24 valence surveillance and everything, just making sure that if this guy decides, hey, today's the day, I'm going to go for it. You're like, all right, we're ready to we're go. We're ready. Yeah, they were yeah. ready. Uh, really ready in spades. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, the, the final part was uh, bring in, um, you know, the undercover, the master undercover yeah. guy, and uh, let's clear up anything else. And then after that, we'll pull the plug. Did you ever <coughs> feel... A level of humanization or sympathy is not the right word, but connection with some of these individuals when you were talking to them and kind of dissecting, you know, their decisions. At, in, at, we were talking about Mike earlier. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no way. I mean, uh, you know, these other creeps, uh, these other jihadists, I mean, you, we knew they were up to no good. And I remember uh, going up to the mosque there. Well, you know, I'll be honest with you. I was, there to surveil, but I was always there. I was there to make a point too that we're everywhere. We're ubiquitous. We're watching you. Uh, of course, there weren't many of us, but uh, let let them think that that they're being watched twenty four seven. But I knew the mindset. I knew these guys. And then there had been a murder of a uh, rival imam to 
Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, the the man, the the Imam, his his rival had been snuffed out by these guys. And so I knew that they were that they were murderers. You know, Syed Nozer was in jail. He killed Kahani, and I knew these other guys had murdered. Uh, uh, the guy's name was Shalabi, Mustafa Shalabi in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So I knew that. I knew they were bad people. So I never once with these cats, never, never, never. And you know, uh, it's funny. Uh, we went into a. Um, uh, this was in, I think, Patterson, New Jersey. We went into a uh, Arabic coffee shop, uh, my partner and I, just to kind of, this was uh, during the Gulf War. We were astounded. All these young men were in this coffee shop watching CNN, and I'll never forget this, the rest of my life. Uh, and I think Trump made a point about this. He may have heard it, uh, not from me, but he, he heard about it. Uh, but but I, I swear, I was with uh, my uh, agent friend, uh, Hank, we went into this place. These guys are watching CNN, and these are the uh, Scud missiles uh, that are flying into Saudi Arabia, killing our people, and 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 you know in Saudi Arabia, our soldiers, and these cats are yelling, "Yella Scud, Yella, Yella!" How you know praising Allah? Uh, go Scud, go! You know, just wishing mayhem and death on our people. And I, I just, holy shit couldn't believe it. Yeah. You know, I got so pissed off and, and this is my country and you're in here, you know, in my country, uh, backing Saddam Hussein and backing the murder and, and, and mayhem that he's creating and killing our soldiers, men and women. This is insane. So, uh, I never felt any empathy for, for these guys. Mm -hmm. Never. So, there is one more story that I definitely want to dive into, but was there any other kind of key highlights you think that were happening at that point that really stuck out to you that you think were either definitive of the time or had a direct impact just on your career up to that point, or I guess your your mindset while being at the FBI? Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, I can think of one other case in which uh, I went over to Brooklyn to <clears throat> look into the Shallaby murder because I knew there was something... There was something about it, and and um, and I thought, hey, that the uh, the police precinct, uh, he was murdered in the police precinct where my father uh, was a uh, police officer. So I was like going back to the old the old place. So I went in there, and um, it was at night, and I remember the desk sergeant, uh, and he said, uh, "What are you doing here?" And I said, uh, "You know, if you have any of this stuff on the Shallaby murder, I'd like to look at it." And he goes. They're foreigners. What, what do you care? And I said, I care because they're foreigners. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I went in there. He's very nice. He gave me all the stuff. And as I started to go through the uh, stuff taken out of his apartment, I started seeing stuff from um, North Carolina, from Fort Bragg, lots of stuff. Like, and I thought, wait a second, where, where, where shall I be getting all this stuff? Not realizing it was just the beginning of this realization that there's something bigger going on here. And, you know, there were manuals on how to make bombs on weapons and just some crazy stuff. What, what, why did, why does he, this guy have all that? So, and it was just a, a treasure trove of contacts that he had and uh, stuff in Arabic. And I said, this is, this is really good stuff. So um, if, and, and I gave it to my squad and I said, please, Please look at this stuff. This I think there's something going on here that just doesn't smell right. And um, that, apparently that never happened, unfortunately. And I'm not going to point fingers. And who am I to say I was gone, right? I left. Um, but what, what this was was pointing a, a finger at a, a, a double agent, a triple agent. He was an Egyptian who was living in the States. He was formerly with the Egyptian army. He was a fundamentalist, closet fundamentalist jihadist. He comes to the States, and now he's working in Fort Bragg. He oh got a God. job with the military. So what he was doing is he was getting all this stuff and sending it to his buddies up in uh, Brooklyn and New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but then and the New York uh, task force saw some of this. He would also uh, go uh, um, firearms training in Long Island with some of these guys. And he was, you know, he's training them. He did a lot of training. And, you know, as, as, and there's a book about him, Ali, Sergeant Ali Mohammed. And then he was not only that, but then he would take these trips. He would, you know, get off. He'd go to uh, visit bin Laden. 
He's hanging out with bin Laden. He's doing security for bin Laden. And then he's also involved in the embassy bombings as well. He's casing the joint, casing our embassies. So, I, you know, again, if I could go back in time and do, do it over again, I probably would have stayed, you know, knowing what I know today, because that would have led right to this triple agent. And, you know, maybe, maybe the embassies, it's hard to say, you know, it's maybe not fair that I uh, say that, but I just sometimes wonder what if. Does the ignorance around, because it seems like it's kind of a commonality where, you know, you highlighted what's happening here, highlight with N- NYPD where they originally treated the murder as just some lone homicide, psycho. Yeah, yeah. Homicide, yeah. Was the ignorance around the situation pissing yeah. you off? Like, how, how'd that feel? Because especially you, I mean, we've highlighted this, the background yeah. in the Middle East, the understanding, like. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think it was, again, um, I, I don't think we could see this coming. I mean, I. I was I I knew about the forces that were out there and I took it seriously, but we were so engaged in so many things. Um and and, and you know, if you if you screw up, um, you know, there are dire consequences. Not not just that uh, not just that evidence that I took out of Shalaby's um um locker, but even before that with Said Nozer and the 30 or something boxes that we had, uh you know, I figured there might be some pretty good stuff in these boxes. And I know that we, C-10, had it for a little bit of time. I don't remember if it was a day or two days or a week or whatever before we turned it over to either the JTTF New York or to the NYPD. But it turns out that these boxes were not looked at. They were not opened until after the first World Trade bombing. And inside these boxes were all kinds of things, again, Fort Bragg, how to do this, how to do that, and a lot of stuff that had we opened it up and looked at it and really dedicated our time to these uh, to this evidence, you know, who knows? Who knows what we could have avoided? Yeah. It's actually where, to wrap up, I guess, the yeah. terrorist talk, yeah. the 9-11 bombings, so a lot of, or not the 9-11 bombings, apologies, the World Trade Center bombings, a lot of people... Again, we're highlighting this is everyone thinks it all started at 9-11, but it wasn't the first time that Trade Center ads been hit. Right. You speak on this and you speak on a dream that oh. kind of develops around this. Yeah. So can you maybe speak to that situation and the feelings that kind of surround it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's painful. Um, the uh, The first world trade bombing is painful because... We had people killed. I think there were five or six people that were killed. One, one was a pregnant uh, woman. Um, you know, you, you, I'm sitting back watching this play out, and uh, for some reason I felt guilty. Uh, why hadn't I stayed longer? Maybe, maybe, you know, you, 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 I start torturing myself with this, with this idea. And um, so I don't like watching. Uh, I would just get so sentimental, and um, I'd feel so depressed. To, to see it on television, you know, the World uh, Trade Bombing 1993, uh, you know, I, I didn't do enough to stop it. Maybe I could have done something. So, you know, that's why this dream sequence plays out for me where, you know, I go back in time with, with Hank, my partner, and we stop them dead. We stop them right there. Whatever happens, but we stop them. So it's just something I have to live with. Mm-hmm. And I know too, I mean, you highlight this as well. You had an interaction with one of the um, oh, yeah. apparent bombers for yeah. on a train ride. It's kind of eerie. Uh, eerie connection. Yeah, eerie connection. Uh, what a coincidence, um, you know, that this person would play a role in the bombing. And where do I meet this guy? In the World Trade Center. Can you right? speak to yeah. Yeah. what led to that and everything. Yeah, sure. Uh, so this was a Christmas party that we, uh, C-10 was invited to in New York. Uh, they had a party and they invited us to come over. Uh, I went and I went with uh, Detective Sergeant Kevin Torme, who was with the state trooper. Um, so we went to the party there in New York. We had a great time, but we had to get back. You know, we have to get back on the other side of right in, into New Jersey. So we had to go to the PATH train and... Um, who do I run into uh, but uh, one of these jihadists? Um, uh, and I, I knew he was immediately. I saw the long beard. And I said to Torme, I said, hey, that's that's one of the Sheikh's, Sheikh Omar's guys, mm. for sure. He goes, oh, come on. yeah. How do you know that? I said, I know that. I just know that. So um, 
you know, we're on the train, he's in our car. And I said, I'm, I'm going to talk to this guy. And he goes, oh my God, you talk to everybody. <laughs> and I said, no, no. So I go over there and I start talking to this, uh, to this uh, Palestinian guy. Um, it turns out that his name is Mohammed Salame. And he be, turns out to be one of the bombers uh, for 1993. But at the time I'm talking to him and uh, I introduce myself in Arabic. And he's like, whoa, his eyes were like biggest saucers. And I said, hey, you know, I'm Ken Strange. I give him my business card. Now he's, his eyes are even wider. You know, FBI, it says on. I said, hey, you know, I'm... So we're talking and I'm asking him questions. Where are you from? Oh, I mean, I lived in Jordan. I'm Palestinian. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of trying to get some intelligence. Prodding a bit. Right, yeah. prodding him a bit. And at the end, you know, we get to the end of the line and uh, he says, I got to get off. And uh, I said, uh, hey, this could be the beginning of a great relationship. You know, you know what I'm saying? And he goes... Yeah, I think, I think I know what you're saying. Um, so I said, uh, how about your phone number? And he says, no, I, I, I got to go. And off he went. But I remember, you know, I just remembered his face. And then subsequently, after the World Trade uh, Center is bombed, um, there's a newspaper that came out and his face is on the front cover. And it says, the face of terror. And that's when I saw the, the and I said, holy shit, I know this guy. And I gave him my card, you know. And then uh, I remember saying to my wife, I know this guy. And she goes, oh, come on. You're exaggerating. I said, no, I, I met this guy. And you're never going to believe where I met him. And then I uh, remember calling my squad. And uh, no, or they called me. My boss called me. And he said, Ken, uh, we did a, a search warrant on this guy, Mohammed Salame. And I said, uh, I know where this is going, Dan. You found my card in there. Yes, we did. We found your business card. What's going on? And I had to explain it uh, to him. It's kind of funny because I mentioned that to my mother. And she said, oh, son, I know you didn't do it. I know you weren't involved with them. I said, no, mom, that's, that's not it. That's not what's happening. Yeah, no. Yeah. no. Uh, but yeah, no, it was, uh, it was pretty freakish. Um, you, you know, you just, again, wonder if, if, and, you know, again, hindsight is twenty twenty. But, you know, maybe uh, not knowing what I know now, I you know, would have definitely kept him in sight. You know. Yeah, probably. Yeah, more, for sure. Yeah. But he was out there with these jihadists. There were a bunch of them. Plus, if it wasn't him, it was going to be the next, next guy. Next guy, right. You know. Yeah. Um, you had some journalists hit you up as well about that situation, correct? With, uh, yeah. you know, the yeah. trying to create a narrative that wasn't there. Yes, I mean, exactly. What was yeah, there? no, that was uh, like I was being had, you know, that they were using me, uh, that they wanted me to say things that were untrue. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that I knew all about this. I mean, what a story that would have been. Yeah, their idea was you knew about, yeah, that, that's, you knew about it and you did nothing. Or you're involved, some involvement, or, you know, some sensational story. But uh, I said, no, that's, that's not the way it went down. I'm sorry. I have nothing more to say. Did that change your outlook on journalism at all? Oh, well, it, it opened my eyes. Yeah. You know, like, uh, you know, they have their job and they want to do their job. And their job is much different from, from what we do. So, so be careful. Mm -hmm. watch what you say if you're going to say anything. Yeah. How did those on the team react to when you kind of broke down the story and everything as well, or even the fact that journalists were trying to manipulate yeah, it? Yeah, you know, look, I had I had moved on to another agency, so yeah. I never got a chance to talk with them about that, really. Um, never had a chance to discuss it. Mm -hmm. So let's go to more lighthearted measures. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the Castro story is oh, geez. Yeah. hilarious. And I also... I'm a bit confused by the ending, so I kind of <laughs> want to like. That's why I had to talk about it. Yeah, sure. Like, what happened? Yeah, sure. Can you? I guess starting from the top, like you end up finding this individual going back and forth from Cuba. So well, he you know, finds us. He finds you guys. Correct. That's right. He's a walk-in. So, can you highlight this story? I guess just where it all kicks off. Right. So, uh, you know, one of our responsibilities was Cuban intelligence because you know we have a large uh, Cuban American population in New Jersey. So, uh, you know, Diaz was our, our guy, and he was working that, that aspect of intelligence. And uh, I don't know if he had moved on, uh, transfer, or if he was out for something. And uh, so they asked me to do it as a collateral duty. They said, would you step in and help us out on the desk, Cuba, on the Cuban desk? Si, si, bueno, como no, <laughs> como no. Uh, so <clears throat> this guy uh, walks in, um, and he's... Um, American businessman, and uh, he loves 
fishing. Turns out he loves fishing. He says, um, I know stuff about Cuba. I can help. You know, that type of thing. I can help. So, we, you know, I sit down, I interview him, and he says, hey, I, um, you know, I, go, I, I do some fishing in uh, Cuba. I go down there and I do business in Cuba. And, um, you know, I'm actually, um, I'm friends with the uh, Castro brothers. I'm like, come on, get out of town. He goes, no, no, no. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm respected. And, you know, they, uh, they have this Hemingway fishing contest and I'm into Hemingway. And, I, you know, I donate money to keep Hemingway, uh, the whole thing going and uh, that, that whole, whole thing. So I'm like, well, uh, so what do you want? And, and he says, well, I'm going down there on a fishing trip. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to participate, but then, you know, I'm going to see the Castro brothers. Yeah, meet with the guys. Yeah, right. So I, I said, uh, well, um, then I find out, you know, there's this embargo on, and you shouldn't be doing that really, right? So I said, that's all on you. I, I said, you know, I, I can't tell you what to do. Uh, you know, you're going down there is even maybe suspect. Uh, but, you know, if, if you hear anything, let us know. <laughs> we left it at that. And uh, then the next thing I know is he calls me and he said, hey, I'm just about ready to go down there. You know, I'm going to fly down to Florida and the Keys and take my boat down to Cuba and fishing, uh, the whole fishing tournament. But there's this guy that I uh, just met him. He's a really nice guy. Uh, I think he's... Um, from Israel, and uh, he he's also a fisherman. Uh, what are the chances? Yeah, of that, yeah. What are the chances? So uh, he's he's going with me. Uh, so now I'm you know I'm looking into his background. I'm thinking, oh Christ, this this sounds like a Mossad type uh, arrangement. So uh, he goes down there, and then the next thing I know, I get this call uh, about a week later, ten days later, from uh, I think it was Customs, and they said, hey. Uh, there's this guy, uh, he's, he, you know, he was in this fishing tournament. You know, he's not supposed to be down here. Uh, you know, but there, but there were a lot of Americans down there doing the same thing. He goes, uh, he says uh, he's working for you. And I said, no, 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 he's not working for me. I know who he is, but he's not working for me. Name dropping the yeah, FBI. Yeah, 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 get out of jail type thing. So, um, you know, I said, no, no, just... He goes, well, we took a lot of his stuff. He, he got one of the biggest uh, Marlins in the tournament, and we confiscated that. And I said, good, good. We also took some uh, Cuban rum off of him. And Good, good. That's good. Uh, and so I didn't think anything about it after that. You know, I just figured I haven't heard from him. You know, I'm not going to be proactive. You know, it's him coming to me. Um, you know, if he finds something out, okay, fine, I'll listen, right? And then, the, then this videotape shows up. Yeah, that from him. That and I'm like, huh? So can that, you highlight I, the videotape because that blew my mind. No, that. I mean it was it was bizarre. I mean it was um, you know I, I get the tape, and I, I remember going uh, upstairs, downstairs into another floor where they had this cassette player, a VHS uh, player. <clears throat> I put it in, and it just it, it became it was bizarro, bizarro. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's him. First of all, it's him at the Hemingway. A monument or the Hemingway House. And I'm thinking, okay, well, that's what he said he's doing. It makes sense. But then he's with Teofilo Stevenson, the Cuban boxer. And I said, wow, that's, I, I know boxing. I know, that guy's a great boxer. You know, he could have beaten Ali, I think, yeah. in, in, his, in his prime. And I said, well, this is really, he's really in Cuba. He knows some people. And then the next thing, and, and there's the Israeli guy always with him as well. But so like a Ramora fish, you know? I, Cause yeah, you highlighted that you're like this guy's a ghost. Like, were you pretty locked in? He was probably a Mossad. Or I something. think so. I yeah. think so. Just you know, go figure. I mean, at the last minute he shows up. Hey, I you know I'm a fisherman. Big fisher. You going to Cuba? Hey, love to go with you. Yeah. I can keep you good company. You know, I can talk a lot. I can, you know, I can even juggle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I mean, uh, the next thing you know, I'm, I'm seeing uh, these guys with uh, Raúl Castro, and they're in some kind of a tunnel, and he's. Uh, you know, he's going on about, oh, I wish the U.S. relationship was better with us because the times were very, you know, we didn't have a very good relationship with Cuba. Still don't. <laughs> right, Still right. Don't. And, and so, you know, he's kind of, kind of, um, it's kind of like he's fishing for some, you know, feel sorry for us. We're, we're not a big threat. Uh, however, I'm here in the tunnel and we have some, oh, there's a tank and there's a howitzer and that, you know, and I'm thinking, holy God, what is this? You know, you know it's like passive aggressive. Like we want better relations, but if you attack us, 
We're yeah. ready to go. We got a few tunnels here. Check it out. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just freaking saying, what is, what's going on here? And then like it switches to, uh, they're in, you know, some, some office and, and, and there's again, Raul Castro. And this time Fidel is with him and they're talking and, and there is our guy and there's the Israeli guy and, and, uh, you know, they're drinking, they're, they're, they're joking and, you know, it's Spanish going back and forth. And then, um, you know, peace to America, peace to our countries, this, that, this, that. And then at the end of the tape, Raul Castro looks into the, uh, I guess it was a camcorder, and he says, Agent Strange, are you getting all this? Holy, <laughs> I, that part, like, oh, my God. I, I would cracked up when I saw that, and I said, oh, boy. Holy shit. <laughs> this is going to the Department of Defense or the CIA or both. Yeah, so you sent it over to them. I mean, like, yeah. What was, I mean. <laughs> you know, I just, what, what I think was going on is that uh, he was kind of making overtures to the United States, like, look, uh, we're a friendly nation. Um, we've fallen on hard times. Uh, but, you know, we will defend ourselves if we have to, but we'd rather not. And and and, and so, and, and anyway, I, I don't know. After that, uh, what happened I never saw this uh, businessman again. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Yeah, today. hopefully Castro wasn't too angry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I'm just wondering. So um, you know, he's still alive. Uh, okay, so he's he's still alive. He's in his like he's in his 90, 91. Okay. And I thought about he didn't get the Putin route done. Y- yeah, yeah. I, and I thought about I don't know. It's kind of fantasized about uh, going down there with my book and, and you know, great promotion. Take a picture. I mean, why not? Anyway, yeah, why, yeah. Why not? Except that you know. It, Cuban intelligence. I, I do want to come back home. Yeah. So would they, oh my God. Um, who do you think broke then? I mean, yeah, this is all a hypothetical, but who do you think broke in that? Like, did they figure it out that he was working at the FBI or was he, did do you think they sent him up to like be able to coordinate? I, like, I think, think that no, I think they worked him to get a message out to the uh, U.S. government, mm-hmm. which was successful. They, you know, it came to me and it went out to, to the Department uh, Department of Defense and the uh, CIA, so I think he got his message across, and I think that was the purpose of the uh, you know the show all uh, video. Yeah, and and you know they seem like very nice guys. Like you'd want to just hang Have out a cigar and, with and them. party with them, right? Yeah, they, they just seem like nice, and they you know. So um, I, I think that's what was going on. Do you think they sent him to your doorstep when you guys first met him, or do you think that they just I, that, figured that, it I, out? I, um, I. I I think it was on his own volition that he came to us and then they kind of co-opted him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for me, uh, this, um, the passenger that he took on at the last minute, it'd be interesting to really find out who that guy was yeah. and, and, and what he did after the trip. And, you know, maybe he's in Tel Aviv. Or yeah, no, because it, it's funny. Like you guys got good information from the video, but also yeah. kind of got to saw what's going on. Yeah. But they like turn off the camera and they're like, all right, now time to show the real <laughs> yeah, stuff. Yeah. And he's like, yep, I'm on your guys' <laughs> side. And exactly. then, you know, they end up showing him the nuclear launch codes or whatever, <laughs> not that they have them, but um, yeah, whatever they got. And he's just like, oh, I'm bringing this all the way back. Yeah, and for me, like, uh, it, was, uh, it was hilarious. Yeah. In, in, in the end, it was hilarious. Oh, I was reading. I had like... I was in disbelief where <laughs> to have, I mean, you know, it would have been one thing for even one of the two individuals to be the ones that leaned over, but you getting all this. Yeah. The fact that it was Castro's brother is just so surreal because <laughs> it's, I mean, those are like in a weird way of all the leaders that have happened around the world. Right. You got Putin, you got G right now. Right. Scary guys. You yeah, know, yeah. you got, go back then, you could pick whatever leader of the Soviet Union or, you know, what. Most of the time, the world leaders are like, you're like, I'm kind of scared of those guys. But what you're highlighting with the Castros, like, they definitely did some bad stuff. Yes. Oh, yes. But yeah. they had a vibe. Yeah. You know, uh, he, he came across so convincing, uh, Raul, yeah. that you almost wanted to be his buddy. Yeah. You know, like, oh, you're, you're pretty cool. But then you realize, you know, the people that he had assassinated. Then you have to stop and say, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Do Probably really want to be that. friendly with him. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's what, yeah, it's fun. Because it's weird. And Cuba, st- maybe it's because it's an island country and it's right. not Russia. Right. But yeah, it, uh, it's funny. It's like those are the only world leaders where it'd be like comedic for them to look in the camera and be like, you getting this? And yeah. You're like, oh yeah. my God. Yeah. Well, you know, it was not easy getting that story uh, through the FBI. You, you, you do know that, the, you know, I signed an agreement with the FBI when I joined the FBI so that if I publish anything afterward, 
uh, they have first rights to see the book. And that's what happened. And they, they were with my book for about 16 months. And so that's why in the book you do see, you do see redactions. You've seen them, mm-hmm. right? So, um, and it was interesting because, and I'm kind of switching over here. Please forgive me for that. But No, no, go for it. Um, you, you know, uh, they, when they went through it, I was surprised when it came back to me. I was surprised that they let some stuff through that, uh, that I thought, mm, if I were them, maybe I wouldn't let it through. I would have redacted and there were some things that I thought were totally innocuous that they decided to redact. And it, it evolved into a negotiation at times. Like there's one story in there, um, the goiter man. Well, I didn't think that there was too much in there for them to worry about or to keep out. And yet they redacted half the story. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there were, you know, other things that uh, like uh, crow's nest that went right through hardly a, a blemish. Uh, so, you know, go figure. Uh, but it was uh, not easy kind of waiting around and then, and then we'd negotiate and then, okay, you can put this person in there, uh, but you have to change his uh, occupation or her occupation. And, and then, and then when they tore apart the uh, one story, I came up with crow's nest to kind of, you know, make up for that uh, mm. previous story. So it, it was, uh, I, I guess you could write a, a book about that process. I was going to ask, so what do you think, as much as you can get into it, is there reasoning behind like a lot of those decisions and stuff? Is it just ongoing cases? Is it just? No, I think it's protecting sources and methods. Okay. Yeah, they just want to, you know, that's a big thing. I mean, if everybody's out there exposing, uh, you know, our informants, um, you know, uh, openly, um, then who's going to want to be an informant, mm-hmm. right? So that, that's that's what they say, you know, we're just protecting sources and methods. And how does that litigation work, again, if you're able to speak to it, like going back and forth and being like, well, yeah. these are, you know, uh, the, the reviewers, uh, there were some attorneys uh, involved as well. So once in a, once in a while, uh, you know, I'd get on the phone and, um, you know, I guess we would negotiate. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes they said, hell no, hell no, we're not going to, no, it's got to be like that. And um, other times uh, we kind of worked together to to get it out without, you know, Getting it compromising. Out. Yeah. sources and methods. So we worked together on it. It was, it was an interesting, interesting process. And not only that, but not only was the FBI a stakeholder in this, but uh, Justice Department had to see it as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think AID also looked at it, but they, they didn't have anything there. Uh, Department of Justice, they had maybe a handful of little edits, but it's the FBI that had. I was going to ask, are, there, are other agencies, like CIA, I feel like, would they be in, do they do anything with this? Or uh, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. They weren't, no, you know, and it's funny. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll let it. Yeah, I don't should, want to, I don't want to get yeah, too yeah. into the. Uh, That's why I know it's like a, it's like, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah, I got to be careful. Back and forth on that. So jumping into USA and I guess wrapping up time with the FBI. Um, I guess first, what was the decision there to jump from FBI to to this new opportunity? I mean, it was yeah a new unique opportunity. So right. what was the what was the calculus yeah. there? Yeah, I mean, so the, after the Gulf War, I left after the Gulf War pretty much. So after the Gulf War, there was a lull in uh, in our activities. And uh, at about the same time, I met um, an ex-FBI agent uh, in uh, Newark. And he was with this Agency for International Development and uh, with the Inspector General's office. So we had lunch and he said, man, we could use someone like you. Uh, you know, you've got the overseas uh, and, you know, we're a very small group, so you'll travel a lot. And you know, I love traveling. I love seeing uh, other countries. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, we could put you, uh, you know, you're a Spanish speaker. Costa Rica is a place where you could work. You know, w- would you like to work in Costa Rica? I said, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't so, be a bad spot. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you know, that, and, and again, uh, then there were other former FBI agents. And I thought, well, you know, this, you know, maybe, uh, and I do like the international uh, part of things. So, uh, you know, I decided to try it. And I, and I thought, if it doesn't work out, um, you know, maybe I can get back with the with the FBI. So, you know, that was my reason pretty much for, for doing that. Yeah, and I mean, in a couple of years, too, you had enough of a career. I feel like you'd be like, all right, maybe take a step back from it. Well, you know, <laughs> it's funny. Crazy. It's funny you mentioned that, Connor, because uh, I remember when I left, uh, they had a party for me in the in the office. I mean, not C, yeah, and C-10 through the party, but a lot of people came. And I remember one FBI agent was one of these cynical guys in the back, back and, and, and as the party wound up and I walked 
passed him and he said, yeah, good luck. He said, I don't, strange, I don't get it. You're here three years and you get a party like this. I mean, how does that work? <laughs> and I said, well, I was busy. I'm a fun guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let's go to Costa Rica. I mean, yeah. we were talking about this before jumping on the pod. It's just like a hilarious story. Um, a pretty notable group, especially recently, uh, Hezbollah actually put out a hit on you. So could you talk well, about? Oh, 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 hold on. Hold, hold that thought. Hold that thought. Um, I don't know. I, I, w I ended up on a list, but to this day, I don't know what the list means. Uh, it could be a hit list. It could be, I don't know. We, we just don't know. Uh, but, you know, that whole thing, uh, again, the FBI, I was in Costa Rica now with my new job. And I got a call from a unit chief in D.C. And uh, that's when he said, uh, we've been looking for you, you know. And I said, yeah, I've, I've been out of the bureau for two years. Uh, well, we found you. We just found you. And uh, we feel we have to warn you about about something. And I'm like, oh, what is it? What? What?" And he said, uh, you know, uh, we've had several um, sources. Uh, and these are corroborated, two sources corroborated, uh, that you're on a list, a Hezbollah list. And I said, oh, great, you know. And then, uh, but, uh, you know, there's another FBI agent on that list. There's a CIA uh, officer on the list as well. So there's a total of three of you. And the, the information came from uh, uh, one of our northern neighbors. I'm not going to say the country. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I said, well, what do I do? You know, what kind of list? And, they, and he said, I just don't know. We don't know what kind of list that is. We, but we're, we're, we're just giving you a heads up. We feel we, we have to do that. We should do that. Are you packing? And, and that's, you remember in the, in the book, mm -hmm. I said, you know, packing? You mean to leave? Yeah, I'm in Costa Rica. I'm not leaving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he said, no, packing is in a gun, you know. Do you have a gun? Yeah. And I said, no, we don't, we don't carry weapons overseas. So he said, well, you know, uh, you should report this to the RSO, Regional Security Officer, which is what I did. But um, so to this day, I don't know uh, what that meant. But I, I must have, and look, I did not work Hezbollah Matters. So I must have, you know, in my day-to-day uh, -day over there, I must have um, bumped into people that had affiliations with Hezbollah, and um, and maybe they just didn't like what I was doing. Yeah, I mean, you highlighted this as well. Like, it seems like when you look at a lot of these guys, they have multiple affiliations, yes. or they're like, yes. they're part of this group, but they're actually part of a subset group <clears throat> that's actually part of this group, and it's... That's right. You're such an inner web of activities that, you know, you can end up on something without even... That's right. Well said. ...purposely doing that. That's exactly right. Um, did anything ever... So nothing ever really came of that, or is it just... Nothing ever came of it. I mean, you know, Thank for... Thank God. But, yeah, I mean, for a few years, I was kind of looking over my shoulder, mm -hmm. but then, you know, with time, it's like, you know, why would why, why would they want to do anything to me? I'm out of this... I'm out of the scene. They probably figured out I don't work there anymore. So, yeah. so moving from the FBI, you joined the USAID. Can you maybe explain what that is and and what? Because yeah, I mean, this is a uh, this was a pretty recent agency. I mean, it goes back to Kennedy, 1961, where they administer uh, aid to our uh, our foreign partners, all kinds of aid, you name it. Uh, you know, foodstuffs and monies, and, and they support contracts and subsidize different things. So uh, we were basically this uh, inspector general's office of AID. And so we had oversight uh, to, I don't know, 40,000 employees or however many there were and to all their programs that, that distribute aid. And when you know, when you're distributing aid, there's a lot of money circulating. And so there's the opportunity for fraud. Yeah. A little bit of stuff disappearing. <laughs> right. And it's, and you know, there's, we were a very small group. Uh, we were kind of like a secret, this little secret in the government. Uh, and, you know, so you, and, and right away, you know, you were kind of your own, you know, you, you, I need to go to Russia. You know, I ended up in the Ukraine once, um, or, you know, I'd go down this, my, my area was eventually, uh, South, uh, Central South America. Mm -hmm. So what was the initial training or first steps into joining that organization? Cause it's obviously very different yeah. from oh, yeah. joint terrorism task force. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, I, we're talking about Tom earlier, like it's more similar akin to, you know, yeah. that side of white collar fraud. Exactly. So right. what was the first few steps there? Right. So, you know, there was a, uh, a learning curve for me because I didn't have a fraud background. But what I did is I latched on to uh, two fellas, former FBI guys who were, you know, had an accounting background, fraud background. And I just I just 
talked to them all the time. I learned as much as I could. I went with them on their cases. I watched, I participated, and I slowly learned, you know, how to put together a, a white collar uh, fraud case. So, it, you know, in the beginning, it was a little uncomfortable for me. I was in a kind of unknown territory, but I, I soon got the hang of it. And um, yeah. What was the first standout case where you really felt like you're like, I'm good with where going? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, there was there just, there was that simple uh, fraud case out of DC, whether, you know, the contractor, uh, to the agency, um, you know, the, this was a contractor based in Maryland. And then this guy was working, um, uh, you know, as a contract employee and he was uh, basically providing, um, uh, these were like supplies to, uh, the state department and to the agency for international development. And, uh, we, I got a tip from one of the ladies that was working for AID in the, um, in that department. And she said, Hey, uh, you got to see this. Come on over here. I'm going to show you some paperwork. So uh, she shows me the paperwork and we have all these, um, she said, these supplies, take a look at all these briefcases and this color film and the, this product and that product. These are inordinate amounts of supplies. They don't make sense. Uh, we've never seen the spike in, in these supplies being ordered. So, you know, then finally I started making a case um, who's the person, who are the people that are involved? Well, it's, you know, this contracting guy is a supervisor. So I kind of looked at these people and then basically I had to take what was ordered and then go to each department and, and, and be like, you got it. <laughs> right. And you know, I'd go all over. So it took, it took about maybe eight weeks mm -hmm. to find out. And what was interesting and what got me in, really interested is, you know, we'd see 40, like 40 briefcases. And so I'd look at um, I'd look at what they ordered, and there were like two briefcases. So the disparity, something was we didn't order forty. That's what's going on, Mister Strange. We'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> right. So you know, so we put it all together, and then um, you know, we we realized it was this guy, and and I had heard also that he had he was um, into drugs. I found out talking to some of his friends. And then I uh, remember we, um, uh, we opened a case with the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office in uh, Baltimore because the contractor was in Maryland. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, well, let's do a, uh, let's do a, a case on this. Uh, let's issue him a subpoena. So we did, and that's when uh, we got a call from his, his uh, attorney saying, uh, yeah, Fred wants, Fred wants to talk to you mm -hmm. guys. And that's when it broke open. And a uh, real nice guy. You know, you talk about empathy, and I mention it in the book that uh, he, was, he was actually a very soft-spoken, nice guy, but he was a crack addict. And, and so uh, I felt sorry for him. And he, and he admitted, I, I did this. I, I ordered all these things. Uh, and, uh, you know, what'd you do with them? And he said, I, you know, the briefcases, the film, it, that's on the street. That goes really quickly. Yeah. So I just, you know, sell them on the street. Uh, what was interesting is the film, the uh, Kodak Color Film, uh, he, he sold to a, um, a camera store in Arlington that, really? was, that was run by Afghanis, two Afghan guys. And, and so, um, you know, our prosecutor said, you know, would you, would you do an undercover for us, a kind of sting operation, and we'll consider that for your sentencing? And he said, yes. So that happened. We did, we did that as well. Uh, so I said, how did, you, how did you do this? You know, how did you, I mean, I understand... You know, you order all these things, they come in, you know, you're feeding your habit. But your supervisor signed off for this stuff because his name is on, you know, on the end of the paperwork. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, I knew that, you know, every time I'd approach him, it was Friday about uh, three o'clock. And I knew he liked to go home early. So I would just put all these papers and, and uh, he would say, oh, shit, I'll just sign. He's not yeah. even looking. Oh, man. So I, I just, <laughs> I tapped into that. Yeah. You know, and then when I told the boss that, he's like, oh, shit. Oh, my, my bad. Thank you for telling me. I won't do that again. So that was just sad because it was during that crack epi epidemic. And I, I just remember it was kind of um, poignant because when we met at the uh, U.S. Uh, at the U.S. attorney's office, um, Oh, actually, it was the defense, defense, uh, the defense attorney's office, and you know, he says, uh, "Can I have a lift home? I, I don't have wheels." And and then I said, uh, I'll, "I'll take them home." And then she, his attorney, says, "That's odd. 
you, you know, that doesn't happen much. You take him out. I said, no worries, no worries. And as we're driving home, he's actually loosening up, and he actually feels like a relief. You, mm -hmm. He's relieved to get this off his shoulders. And, uh, you know, he told me, uh, yeah, I was in the Army, uh, you know, this and that, but I, I unfortunately I have this terrible uh, addiction. And then I just remember letting him off in, in D.C. and just, I just, I didn't feel good. I, I didn't feel good about, about prosecuting him. I was going to say, God, it, it's a tough one because, it, like, is it a relief to go from stone-faced psychopathic killers <coughs> to at least someone you can humanize with? Or does mm. that make it, was the job tougher, I guess would be? Yeah, I mean, uh, it just, I guess it depends on the personality. I mm. knew some of these people were stone-cold killers and others are not. This guy wasn't. You know, he could have been any other life. He could have been my friend. Yeah. Could have played hoops, hoops together, right? So it's just kind of just the case you know, to case. Uh, you got a sickness. You have an addiction. I, I get it. Mm -hmm. You got to feed the addiction. I get it. I get it. So moving forward, we jump into the DOJ, and you are entering at a pretty crazy time in terms of the situation that you're where you're going. So you're going down to El Paso. Can you maybe highlight, I guess, like what the transition was, why you decided to move to right. the DOJ, right. and then what El Paso was looking like at the time? Right. Hey, you know, uh, excellent question. And so I, I had to reflect on uh, where I was at the Agency for International Development uh, Office of Inspector General. I had done some wonderful things, traveled um, to many, many countries and uh, worked fraud cases, um, many of them successful. But there uh, came a point uh, with uh, management where I, I saw my chances as limited <clears throat> excuse me, as limited moving forward. So uh, I was starting to get uh, disappointed. Um, and there was one case in particular that didn't go the way management wanted it to go. Although, to be honest with you, I didn't see it going any other way. Uh, but w when that happened, um, and, and it was kind of interesting because when that happened, I kind of got this, uh, I got a phone call from someone who said, hey, uh, Department of Justice OIG heard about you. They're interested in you. Would you consider? And I said, yes. Yes, I, I would consider. And um, sure enough, I got a phone call from the uh, special agent in charge of the El Paso office and said, hey, uh, you know, I, I saw your resume. I like what I see. Uh, come on down here. I'd like to interview you. I'll fly you down here and back. And then so it, it was such a great experience to be wanted by, by management in this particular case. And then when I went down there, we had an excellent time together, met his family, had dinner with him. And I, I said, you know what? Uh, this is like another chapter. I'm now on the Mexican border. I speak Spanish. So this could be a pretty cool opportunity. So I took it. Yeah. Life works in a funny way too. Amen. Amen to that. And you're going to the border too, man. And you're going at a time mm -hmm. when the border was hot. And yeah. Juarez specifically, which for people that don't know, so you're going down to El Paso. El Paso and Juarez are neck and neck. Right, right across, right across. You can yep. see right across. And can you highlight, I guess, why Juarez was as crazy as it was at that point? Yeah, drugs, narcotics. Uh, the uh, cartel that kind of operated in our area and was the biggest cartel in the world at the time was the Vicente Carrillo Fuentes uh, organization or VCFO. Uh, so they were, you know, running drugs uh, th over the border uh, into El Paso and then on to distribution in all of our cities. Uh, so they were the big, the big name in town. This is before they started all their internecine uh, conflict and killing each other and before the Zetas and the, you know, the, the, I don't know, the Renaissance or the new movement or whatever they, they changed, they're morphing into. But, but this was the Vicente Carrillo Fuentes group. Can you explain how that group came to prominence? Because like you said, it is at that point was the most powerful cartel. Yeah. And with Amada Fuentes was kind of the, the kingpin at that time. And then, you know, as, as we continue on, you actually get to meet some of the other individuals that led to this. But can you maybe highlight how the Juarez cartel came to be? Yeah, I mean, I think um, if, if I recall correctly, it was just another uh, tentacle to uh, some of the other cartels that were, although the biggest player, but uh, there were other players too, and they were kind of all interconnected. So you had the um, um, Arellano Felix organization, the Sinaloa cartel, all of these kind of in uh, Baja, uh, Tijuana, and, and down in those parts to Arizona. And then Carillo Fuentes was also related to some of the other uh, players 
as well. They just happened to have the biggest distribution uh, routes and areas, but they were all connected either by, you know, um, by blood or by close working, working ties. And they just became bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you know, when um, uh, cocaine became the thing and it was not just marijuana, uh, you know, there was more money involved. The stuff was coming from Colombia, um, you know, became more deadly, uh, more money. It, it became crazy. Yeah. No, I know. I mean, we'll speak about Miguel in a little bit. But. And, and, they, and they squeezed the um, Miami corridor to some of the drugs. So the, uh, you know, that was all kind of uh, tapped down, um, buttoned down. So now everything started to go through the Southwest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say the, I know Juarez at that time. So Amato was the original kingpin for them. He got super popular for basically just flying everything right over. Right. And Juarez was also the biggest route for the border at that time. So they were just right. cashing in. Mm -hmm. But with drugs and money always comes extreme violence. So Juarez at that time was top notch, one of the most mm -hmm. dangerous cities in the world. Um, so can you, I guess, can you speak to that as well, moving directly across the border? And, yeah, you know, the I, I mean, I there? know, look, when I was uh, there, the, the big problem was with these missing women. And you'd hear about it all the time. And if you went over to the Mexican side, you which which we did, you know, we but we stayed in the tourist zone. We'd cross the border and stay in the tourist zone. But you would see placards and flyers saying, you know, looking for this woman, that woman. And, and, and there, were, there were tons of missing missing women. <clears throat> I don't know why that was. Maybe uh, it's, it's, it's part of the drug, the whole drug trade. Uh, but uh, I knew it was dangerous for women. And then as it evolved um, and, and more and more drugs and then more competition, uh, it got um, more and more deadly. Yeah. That, I mean, no, that's – it's one of the craziest situations as well because it, it's like – it, it, what happens down there? I've had a number of narco journalists on. And it's like one of my favorite topics to go into. Mm -hmm. It's just because it's so insane. But how everything operates as well is it's like an ebb and flow. So you have certain cities that, you know, are the new power kingpin and, and stuff just goes to absolute shit real quick. So one of the quick stories I wanted to jump <clears> in <throat> was um, the corruption at the border. A lot of, I mean, I, Still now, but always, there's always been corruption at the border. Again, when there's drugs and money, there's yeah. violence and corruption. Sure. Can you highlight the story of Callum, I believe his name was, and, you know, yeah. basically the corruption detailed around there with Juarez? Yeah. So, you know, part of our job as OAG, we, you know, we had oversight of uh, all the justice components, um, you know, personnel and their programs. Again, pretty much like AID, same idea. Uh, so... You know, we um, we had oversight of the um, uh, customs, uh, not customs, sorry, INS, uh, Border Patrol, Bureau of Prisons was pretty big. I did mm -hmm. a lot of uh, prison work as well. Uh, and um, I'm trying to think, marshals, the marshal service, we had the crazy case there, um, kinky case. Uh, but yes, uh, so we had oversight of all these, um, all these uh, d departments. And I forgot the question. Uh, I was saying for the corruption case with Column at the border. Okay. Yeah. So we had, uh, again, oversight of all these uh, 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 departments. Uh, with uh, Mr. Callan, uh, he, and again, I, I would see a lot of this. Uh, these are uh, guys that would come to Texas. Uh, they come single. Uh, they'd meet some beautiful uh, Mexican girls. Some of them were innocuous. And uh, some of them were related to cartel people. Unfortunately, in his case, he married a girl that was pretty tight, had family relations with the Vicente Carrillo Fuentes group. So, you know, they work on these people, um, you know, kind of uh, slowly but surely. And I, I believe it progressed from him doing favors uh, and taking chances on immigration documents for family members, you know, uh, that type of thing, until finally they said, hey, there's big money. If you, you know, you're at the... You're at the port of entry, you know, you're the gatekeeper, you wave cars through, you stop them. There's a lot of money in this for you if you just kind of wave our stuff through, you know. So uh, that's that's pretty much how that evolved. And, uh, you know, his, um, his character, again, mm, his moral compass was, um, uh, was just not there. And, uh, you know, it's just too much temptation for him. And, and he gave in. How often were you guys seeing cases like that where corruption was a cartel would find somebody 
in the Fed ranks and just try to slowly break them down. Yeah, you know, not a, not a lot, lot, but um, you know, enough to to keep you busy. Um, we had again, and you know, uh, I, I talk about drug cases, but there were also prison cases as well. But uh, just enough of these drug cases um, to keep you hopping, mm -hmm. uh, and it could be Border Patrol. Um, and it could be, uh, you know, INS like, like Callan. Uh, but yeah, uh, but again, in our situation, because we were small, uh, I would have to depend on, um, you know, assistance from other agencies, interagency cooperation. So I, and, and, you know, I'm that type of guy anyway, so I love to work with other uh, groups. So I, you know, tap into the, um, public corruption unit of uh, the FBI in, in El Paso, work with them or, uh, customs Office of Investigation. So I got to know, you know, El Paso is a small place. So I got to know all of these people and we would work together, pool our resources together to make cases against some of these corrupt uh, individuals. So <clears throat> I definitely want to dive into some of those <clears throat> prison cases you were highlighting because those are, are going to be incredibly interesting. But I guess before just kind of wrapping up some of the more details with the cartels, you did actually do a visit to um, the Alta Plano which is Altiplano, yeah. Altiplano, yes. which is to make it simple, the prison that El Chapo yeah. evidently yes, escaped yeah. from. Maximum security. And you met some very in interesting characters there. So oh, I guess. Yes, I did. Yeah. Can you highlight what that trip was? Yeah. Uh, so this is part of the Merida initiative. And um, I had, you know, uh, I, I applied for this and they, uh, they green lighted me to uh, go to Mexico and to work with our federal counterparts in Mexico and to assist them in establishing uh, an office of inspector general. So I did that, I made two trips to Mexico, a few weeks e each, and I got to know, um, you know, I got to know a lot of federales as well. Uh, great, great relationship I had with them. But during one of my trips, uh, the, um, the, the head of the um, uh, PGR, uh, the, their attorney's office said, hey, uh, why don't you go out and and go to our, you know, uh, we I know you work, uh, Bureau of Prison Cases. So why don't you check out, we have a prison that's, uh, you know, our, we're very proud of this uh, maximum security prison. So why don't you check it out? And so I went with uh, someone from um, the uh, from Justice Department, DC, Howard. Uh, and, and so we visited the Altiplano. And, you know, as it turns out, um, when this, uh, we had the breakfast with the warden, right? <clears throat> and the warden's like, no, no one can ever break out of here. It never happens and never will happen. And, and like, and you Americans, and he's lecturing us on you Americans. And I saw this movie where this helicopter comes into the prison and they escape and you Americans, you, you know, and I'm like, okay, where, where is this coming from? Uh, but then he says, uh, we, you know, we finish up the breakfast and he, you know, uh, in his office and he says, would you uh, like to see some of your American prisoners? And uh, I said, no, I'd like to see some of your, you know, Mexican prisoners, the top ones. And he goes, oh. Okay. He wasn't too happy. And so before you know it, I'm, you know, I'm uh, just a few feet away from some of the most heinous uh, uh, cartel guys in the world. Yeah. I mean, I, that part was, I didn't expect that. It's, yeah. No, neither uh, did I. I. It was unexpected. And, you know, as I mentioned, I'm, uh, you know, I'm in the cell and they're all like kind of lumped together. There's Miguel Gallardo, Felix Gallardo, Felix Gallardo yeah. and he's uh, whining about his underwear. You know, it's, it's. What did, what did the. What was the feeling when, when you see, I mean, again. Pathetic. Yeah. Pathetic. I see the guy and he's moaning and bitching about his uh, underwear. He said, look, the, 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 the warden, look, it's wet, mojado, you know. And then he's got this broke. This I didn't understand. Uh, he says, there's no way we, you know, the uh, communications with cell phones and for the however many miles outside, you know, are disconnected and they can't. And, and yet this guy has a television in his, um, in his cell, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's kind of a broken black and white television, but it's still, why, why is that? Why would you even have that in the cell? Some money. I, I, yeah, I guess maybe you, you paying someone off. Um, so meet him. And, you know, then I'm, I'm like, Whoa, you know, this guy, he was involved in the death of one of our DEA agents, right? Kiki. Kiki, right? Yeah. So I'm like, Whoa, this is, I can't, number one, I can't believe I'm here. Number two, you're such a pathetic piece of crap. Yeah. You know, that type of thing. And then next to him in another cell is one of the Arellano. Um, Felix bro brothers. Yeah, yeah, brothers. 
Now he's he was very quiet. He was very polite. You know, I'm talking to him in Spanish and si sí, señor muy bien, como está usted, you know, that type of thing. But uh, there was something off about him, you know, and I, I in later, what way? Like how do you um, mean? maybe a little touched Auti- autism or something oh, okay, something see. going on. And then yeah. later I, I found out there is something mm-hmm. maybe going on with him. And then uh, finally, uh, you, you know, oh, you know, let's get away from here. I'll take you to our new infirmary. Everything is scrubbed. You know, the nurses, doctors look great. You know, everyone has been uh, polished and uh, it's all staged. Right? Yeah. And, Good uh, old propaganda. Yeah. But, but they're on the gurney sitting there, you know, pulling his shirt off uh, is this, uh, you know, her, her suit person and he's moaning and groaning. And I, I, I instantly went over to him and I said, there's a story here. And I said, um, Senor, how are you? He goes, oh, no muy bien, no muy bien. <laughs> And he started telling me about his about his problems, and only to realize later that uh, he is in fact Don Neto. Don Neto. Yeah. Don Neto. And he's I didn't know Don Neto. I knew very little about him, to be honest with you. But later, when I started going through the Wikipedia, and then I said, "Holy shit! This this guy was a major drug kingpin." I mean, I think he's he's Miguel's know, right hand guy. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yes. Right. I mean, those are three, specifically Miguel and Don Neto. Um, they're El Felix brothers, kind of like the, um, uh, God, what do, what do they call them? Basically like the the second level for the oh. Felix um, brother family. But the two yeah. were at the time the most powerful drug. I mean. Yeah. And he, I've, I've seen the uh, Netflix yeah. thing, right? Narcos. Narco Mexico. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh my God. I'm watching it with my wife saying, that guy, I actually met him. <laughs> yeah. He's pathetic. And the other guy, geez. I was going to say, I mean, that's like, it's weird because, I mean, these were on par with Escobar and Chapa, like they're, they're right. that level. <clears throat> right. So the feeling you got from mm. both of them was right. just kind of like. Right. And, and I knew, you know, I looked at uh, into Gallardo's eyes and I knew he, stone cold killer. He, he'd ice me if he had a chance and I stood in his way. He'd think nothing of it and talk about his stupid underwear, you know, that type of, I just knew these Just nothing types. behind the eyes, yeah. 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 Cold, pretty cold. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, that was a, a very interesting uh, encounter in the prison. And what was also pretty cool is my partner, uh, the attorney from Washington, uh, you know, here's the warden saying it can never happen here and will never happen here. Uh, we have all of this, uh, these precautions and all, of, you know, all the all layers of precaution and uh, whatever. And then the Howard says, but your problem is going to be on the inside. It's going to be the, the guy that works in the cell being paid off. And was he ever right? A few okay. years later, El Chapo, Chapo escapes. escapes from the same place. And it's kind of funny because I remember as I uh, pulled up to the uh, Altiplano, I remember looking around and, and seeing, I could swear, I saw this way out in the kind of boonies, but I could see it because it was, there was nothing to impede the sight. It was like a huge field, and there was this kind of, um, I don't know, this little cabin or barn or something. And I just said, that's odd. And I, I maybe in my mind I thought, tunnel there? Just, you know, just kind of these, the way I think. And maybe that was the one that, the, that they used. I don't know. Jesus Christ. I'm just yeah. guessing. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. No, that's, did you guys ever call up the warden and be like after and be like, Hey, buddy, no. they got out. No, no, no. <laughs> smoke and mirrors, man. Smoke yeah. and mirrors. Or as they said to me, my friend said, mirrors and smoke. God, man, I couldn't have met. It's just crazy because, yeah, I didn't even, I wasn't even putting that together when you were meeting all these guys. And I was like, damn, this is a pretty top notch prison. And the whole time he's like, no one will ever escape. No one will ever oh, escape. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, and, and El Chapa <laughs> ended up escaping. And you're like, oh my God, man. And not even like escape. I mean, literally how you guys predicted it. He paid off the warden. They threw him in a laundry basket. Exactly. And there's even rumors, too, that that was, that he just walked out the front door. Like, not even like, like the, you know, if you go into the hole. Yeah, yeah. Well, I saw the video of him disappearing, you know, in the shower. Oh, so it was that (laughs) one. So he escaped twice. Yeah. Uh, This, um, yeah, this is the one that did with the tunnel. Oh, okay. well, that's even crazier yeah. than, yeah, because they, they were doing heavy construction under there. And yeah. I actually, I had um, Yoan Grillo, who's like a narco journalist. We I know who about, he is. Yeah. I'm we were friends t- with him. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. he's a good man. Good man. Yeah, we good, were talking about it. And great he was journalist. Like, how do people not hear 
construction work <laughs> going yeah. underneath. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. well, when you got enough money to buy, you know, some yeah. headphones, you're good to go. Money talks. Yeah. Man, that's crazy. But anyway, so jumping into some of these prison stories, um, you know, you highlighted it. So so what was the situation going on there? And I guess what were some of the standouts? Yeah, just contraband. Uh, a lot of it was contraband. Uh, just, yeah, uh, just, you know, paying the uh, guards, uh, letting stuff in. And they, you know, it's the slippery slope type of thing. They start, hey, I need a hamburger. Can you get me a hamburger? So once that happens and the guard helps him, now now he's got you. Mm-hmm. Um, I need um, a hamburger and a uh, cell phone, you know. And, and so that that now you're on that slippery slope. You you know, he says, hey, but you got me a hamburger. I don't want to get you in trouble. I wouldn't want to tell anybody. So it kind of starts like that. Uh, so I saw a lot of these contraband cases. They were uh, pretty prolific. Uh, and then there was the sexual abuse cases. Um, I remember one uh, in um, Dallas, uh, Texas. And, and this was kind of interesting because we had this guy dead to rights and he, we actually showed up, we sit him down and uh, he, he is wired tight. He's wound up. And uh, so I, I'm just the second in, interviewee. You know, it's my guy. I'm actually a supervisor. So, you know, Jerry is doing the interviewing, but Jerry's got a laundry list of questions and Jerry is very stuck into this the questions one by one by one. But I'm looking at the guy and he's like just shaking and trembling. And I'm thinking, Jesus, I think he wants to give it up now. So Jerry starts into his uh, preface and the, and the guy's like, I, I need to tell you something. And Jerry's like going, no, 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 like, we'll get there. We'll get there. Now I have, a, I have 20 questions first before you talk. You know? And I'm like, Jerry. And finally I, I pulled him out, Jerry. Just hit it. <laughs> he wants to give it up. Yeah. Just let him say it. He goes, like, you think so? I said, yes, I know so. Uh, and that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> he gave it up. We didn't have to go through two two pages of questions. Yeah, two hours and some donuts. Right, right. So uh, this was, uh, you know, he was um, sexually assaulting some of the, um, the female inmates. Mm. How often were you seeing that with a lot of CEOs? Huh? It was a lot of correction officers, right? That's for yeah. the situation. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it, it did happen. Uh, but one of the craziest uh, uh, ones I'll tell you about it happened in uh, California. And uh, this was a case where the correctional officer is having a uh, relationship with a female inmate. And, you know, we arrest him. And then uh, she's pregnant. Uh, We arrest him. And then uh, we we go to the U.S. Attorney's Office. And for some reason, uh, they decline the case. Because what ensues after that is they get married. And then the, the guy, you know, was with his attorney, he says, Yes, he had relations, shouldn't have done that, but he really loved the girl, had, had sexual, it's his baby, and they got married, so please keep that in mind. And they threw the case out. Oh, what the? No, uh, they fired the guy, yeah. uh, obviously, yeah. but they wouldn't prosecute him yeah. because he was in love and going to have the baby. Happily ever after. It was the craziest. Now, in Texas, that wouldn't have happened. No. <laughs> <laughs> Only in California. So... Again, so you're seeing with the CEO cases, were you, I, some of the guys that I've talked to before have said that this usually happens to younger guys because they're just not making tons of cash or they're like easily susceptible to kind of outside. Like, is that the trend you noticed or what, what was? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be the um, entry level mm-hmm. type CEOs. Um, I think you'd, you'd see a trend there. Uh, but the uh, sexual assaults, young guys, middle-aged, didn't matter. Sexist. As long as they were weirdo. They can get away <laughs> with sex. Uh, but also, you know, you had to be careful, too, because uh, there was some very astute um, um, prisoners that would, you know, um, kind of do it on purpose and then uh, catch the sperm and then say I was assaulted and, you know, sue the, uh, you know, sue the prison, sue the Department of Justice and uh, make money off of it. So you got to be careful there. When you were operating on some of these guys as well, it's kind of funny, like a lot of cases involving federal agents, like <clears throat> versus federal agents kind of deal. It, it's weird because it's almost like they also know the game and everything. Like, sure. was there ever a worry that there was going to be some type of um, revenge? Isn't the right word, but like you know, some level of like. Mm-hmm. Either coming after you or yeah. figuring it out before, and you know what I mean, like kind of yeah, yeah. that type of thing. Yeah, you know, not. I, I'm, I'm sure I thought about it, and I, but uh, I didn't necessarily worry about it. There might be only one guy that I thought he might be 
still pissed at me. I still might look over my shoulder <laughs> once in a while, but apart from that, no, I was never, never really worried. Although, look, uh, you're not going to get any uh, Christmas party invitations from Probably these <laughs> people. They don't want to see you. And when they see you come, they know there's trouble. So you never, they're not welcoming. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So looking to wrap up here, if you could pick out, you know, been all over the world, seeing all the best in the world that the world has to offer. Yeah. If you could pick one thing, one lesson learned or one idea that would be something that you would take away that you would want the viewer to be able to either add to their day to day or understand, yeah. what would that be? Well, you know, I touch upon that in my epilogue. You know, I give um, uh, some advice to uh, men and women like you, uh, young men and women who are considering such a career. And I just lay out what has worked for me in the past and, and what I would do. Um, you know, listening is such a big part of our, our job. Uh, and I've always adhered to this 80-20 rule where when I'm with a, um, uh, a bad guy, bad girl, or whatever, um, I'm talking no more than 20%. That's my rule. They're talking the 80%. But when you see it in practice uh, over the years, it's not always how it works. I've seen it go the other way, where the agent is, you listen to me, you know, and that's, he's not listening. He's talking, and you're not going to get much out of that. you got to listen. You know, it's, uh, so that's my 80-20 rule. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is, um, uh, you know, and, and this goes back to a book I read, um, uh, how, to, how to Make Friends Influence People by Carnegie. Dale, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's Dale Carnegie. It's just, there's, you know, how to interact with people. And again, he'll talk about listening is a, is a big thing. And other things that, uh, how to interact with people, show them respect. Uh, that's, that's a big thing. Um, you know, I've been in situations where the agent will not show respect to the person sitting opposite them. And uh, good luck. Good luck getting uh, information from people like that. You know, and I've also seen people that come in with a stone faced, you know, like, no, no friendship, no, mm -hmm. the, the people are petrified, you know? So, um, I just say kind of act naturally, but, you know, listen to what they have to say. And, uh, you know, I think you'll succeed. You'll, you'll make great cases. Uh, yeah. Well, Ken, my man, this has been a fun one. If you want to give a quick shout out where people can find you on social media and then also the book and I know you got tons of other projects going on, so if you just want to shout those out quick. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so uh, my book is uh, Cop's Son, uh, One G-Man's Fight Against uh, Jihad, Global Fraud, and the Cartels. Uh, it's on uh, Amazon and uh, Barnes and & Noble, and, um, and I'm on all social media platforms, or at least the ones that are uh, well-known. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm on Twitter and uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram, so... Uh, and uh, again, I just want to thank everybody out there that has uh, done this type of job, uh, has served the country. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for your service. Hell yeah. Well, stay in touch. We're definitely going to get another one here soon down in Dallas and we'll, uh, for that next book coming out. But again, Ken, this was, this was a fun conversation and uh, yeah, man, for everyone, go get the book. But again, thank you for everything. And yeah. Thank, thank, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of